Hello and welcome to Love as a Business Strategy, a podcast that brings humanity to the workplace. We're here to talk about business and we want to tackle topics that most business leaders shy away from. And we believe that humanity and love should be at the center of every successful business. I am your host, Jeff Ma, and I want to try something a little bit different today. I've brought together um, people who you might be familiar with, but it's Maggie McClurkin. Hello, Maggie. Hello. <laughs> and Chris Petrie. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Hello. And we worked together on the book. Chris was a co-author with myself. Maggie ran the entire, <laughs> basically made sure we got the book written. And, <laughs> um, and she wrote the foreword. And so um, we had an idea to get together and, you know, just start, I guess we called it a book club. Um, start at the beginning of the book and once in a while have these um, kind of off the cuff kind of chats around and we divide the book very intentionally into different chapters and different sections and we think that there can be just um, learning lessons discussions and new revelations to come out of discussing it today um, and so today we're going to be talking about the foreword uh, one of uh, a fan favorite if you will when we when we pat when we share the book out um, people are always coming back telling us about how the Ford itself was already impactful before the book even began, written by, of course, the amazing Maggie McClurkin here. So um, no icebreakers, none of that. We're just going to dive right in. And I think one of the themes of the forward, Maggie, was around fear. And I think um, you had some, I mean, you have some stories of like previous jobs, right? Of like fear. <laughs> in the workplace. Yep. In a previous job, there was this fear that I could lose my job at any point or do something that would not just like disappoint someone, but like really make them lose my trust. And like, I would have to earn it back in spades and like would almost be on this unofficial form of probation in their mind. Um, and, and that's happened even with bosses that like had not ill intention. Um, I can think of one instance where I was working for a nonprofit right out of college and I was on their marketing team and we were practicing or experimenting with um, using text messages to send to people. And I accidentally sent the wrong uh, text to the wrong group of people. Um, and it was a total accident and it was my first time using the software and I got yelled at. And like every time after that, I was asked to show my work to my boss before mm -hmm. I sent a text out um, because the trust was lost. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't even like a, like I was fine. I wasn't like crying or beating myself up that much about it, but I didn't know that, oh, they don't trust me with this anymore. That sucks. So. I don't know. Oh you just you just <laughs> reminded me when when there I don't know if you guys remember back in the day we we we've done this our company's done a lot of different things for a while we were big on Snapchat you remember and we and I was put in charge of a client's Snapchat account <laughs> and this is back when Snapchat I mean Snapchat's still complicated as an app but this is back when it was user friendliness was not even you know in their vocabulary and so I was put in charge of this account and and. Um, I'd have to log into it and post things like live, you know, Snapchat was like very, very live at the time. It's like mm -hmm. everything had to be recorded in the moment, hit go in 10 second increments. That's what Snapchat was. And I remember I was um, by a pool in my neighborhood with my kids on a weekend. And my kids were being real cute. So I took my phone out and I snapped a bunch of things and I posted it. And I got a message that was like, you're posting, on, <laughs> you're posting on the client's account. Oh no. <laughs> I, I absolutely freaked out. And and it reminded me of that because literally um when I got kind of the the message that things were wrong, it was really like I think back to it also kind of like as a good reminder of what you just shared, Maggie, was like there was no part of it that was like, What's wrong with you? Why did this happen? Like there's it was literally like we have a crisis, we have a problem to fix. Like nobody put any blame on me. Nobody kind of like hung me out to dry and try to like, you know, like put, the problem got solved, 
we talked about it later, but really just as like, how do we avoid this next time? And nobody made me feel bad about it. And nobody like added anything new to like, make sure I never did it again. Like, like beyond just like making sure I, I figure something out. Right. And so your story just reminded me of that because this is a huge, um, it's one, something I actually took for granted in the moment, but when I think back to it, I was like, you know, that was a big deal. There's a lot of money is on the line as well. A lot of, it wasn't just the client that could have an issue with it. And, and so anyways, thought I'd share that random bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that there, those types of stories are prevalent. I think every, like to me, if you are in some sort of corporate position and you haven't had any of those experiences, you have, are you really working? Like, <laughs> Like, <laughs> I was like, are you, are you, are you still playing? Um, so you just dressing up. So, um, I think that there, to me, even I've had those sort of situations where it's like, oh, I sent the wrong email to the wrong person. Uh, granted, I've never done, you know, send derogatory emails to the wrong person. That's, um, that's where I draw the line. But I have made those types of mistakes and, for me, I keep going back to like what Maggie wrote in that um, forward about like operating with no fear and, you know, and talking to so many different executives. That's all they see in their organizations is that fear, you know, and it's it's not so much um, based on anything that's actually happened to them in the organization or by said executive. It's just, you know, um, you know groomed and conditioned and, and reinforced in subtle and nuanced ways to the point where you know, people are, are challenged and struggling with just being honest and open with their, you know, chief executives, you know, um, and with their senior leaders, because they don't see them as human first, they see them as titles, right? And, and I think that that's, that's always been the odd thing about working in this corporate space is that, you know, I don't know if I was just naive. I'm like, everybody's a human, right? We all put on our pants together. And that's maybe because my mom was like, everybody put on, my, on, put on their pants one leg at a time, just like me. And so <laughs> that's the way I have just, that's the mentality. So, you know, when I meet people, I just think of them as human, not as the titles first. Um, but that's not, that's not always the case. And if you, if you all of a sudden throw me into a sales conversation, I do change that mindset. And I'm like, they're a customer. They might have something and I might be unselling, right? Um, but I think that fear, um, and it's oftentimes around titles, but it, it, it seeps into other things. It changes sort of the complexion of a lot of conversations. Um, and oftentimes it's invisible. Yeah. I think... Um when it comes to fear, it feels like as humans, fear will never go away per se. But I think mm -hmm. it's the type of fear that we we talk about and how we get through it per se, because like, I still get afraid all the time of screwing up mm -hmm. and looking bad, you know, I'm afraid of letting people down, things like that. But I think there's a much more I think Maggie, you put it against Maslow's hierarchy <laughs> of like, <laughs> of like, of needs, I, I think, Maggie, you say it better than I do. What is yeah, it? I mean, there's like, and it, you were talking, Jeff, about like, there's still always going to be fear there. And and to me, like, yes, but also like, and I gave the example of my current job now with you guys that um, whenever in a previous job, if I were to get a phone call or an email from my boss, it was an immediate like real fear that like, oh, I'm going to be fired right now. Like, this is what this call is for, or I'm going to be in trouble. He's, there would be times he'd call me just to see where I was, like, just to make sure I was working. Um, wow. <laughs> and so there was just like constant fear of like, I need to prove my worth to this person all the time. Um, but now, like if Mo says he needs to chat, there is like a little fear but not because I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my job but because I'm probably gonna have to have a tough conversation with him that I just don't want to have this. I just don't want to but um it's not it's never like oh well this is the end for me like pack, pack up my desk and go and so how I compared it to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs was like I feel secure and safe in the fact that like nothing I unintentionally do will probably 
end my job here at Softway. There are definitely things I could do on purpose. <laughs> and there are definitely <laughs> things that I could do consciously. Um, but as far as like accidents or conflicts or mistakes or learnings or anything like that, I, I really do have that security that I'm, it might be tough, like getting through the, the thing and having those conversations and learning from whatever I messed up on. But I, I never, I never, at this point, it's taken me some time to deconstruct from previous bosses, but um, I never think my job is at stake if I make one mistake ever. And so I think that there's a less severe version of fear. And I think Chris said it best of like, it maybe even is just more desire to people please instead of a fear. Mm, yeah. No, and I think that that's, that's critical. And <clears throat> when you, when you get into that desire to, to please or to make others successful or to help others, right? Like you put more pressure on yourself. So what you're, you're thinking about is performing against that pressure and not sort of failing in that performance. Um, but like when I think about fear, to me, sometimes it's irrational. <laughs> it's like someone has never fired me for this before. I've never seen anybody get fired for this, but I'm still afraid. Like it could happen to me. I could be the first, right? <laughs> and we create these scenarios, <laughs> these like long drawn out sort of situations where it's like a lot would have to be true <laughs> to come to that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> right. And a lot of things would have to happen serendipitously in order for that outcome to be real. Um, and I've had uh, I've had a friend who used to come up with these crazy scenarios before a meeting or one on one with their, with our mutual um, boss. <laughs> I'll be like, OK, wait, I'll just, I want to I'm going to retell what I just heard and see if it makes sense. So you're saying that because you didn't answer your phone at this time when we all know that you drop your child off you think that the one-on-one -on -one that was set is going to be the 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 firing of you when we have eight deliverables that are due on billable pro like wait so I'm like <laughs> like so I, just, I want to make sure that i'm getting your concern right and you know it's just it's it's real for people mm -hmm. and you know i think the in talking to a ceo even just this week that that type of fear is what keeps them up at night because on the other side of that fear is the fear of being misperceived as an as a leader i think mm -hmm. right the 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 misinterpretation of a conversation or the oversight of a conversation i didn't know you needed to hear from me in that moment um, and because of that you walked away with this impending doom situation and scenario that you think is going to end in ultimately your demise and the end of your livelihood, career, whatever. <laughs> and that's not at all in my head. And had I known that that was what you're going to walk away with, I am now in fear that every time I leave the room or leave a conversation or leave an interaction, someone's walking away with that. And so you overcorrect and over engineer. And for me, now where I am, like, I have to make sure that my words are not leaving an impression that I don't intend to leave, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, making sure that, you know, conversations that I have are, are not going to create that type of fear. Mm -hmm. And so when one side walks in fear, it automatically makes the other side also operate in that fear, too. So it's not like this, mm -hmm. you know, um, one sided um, coin, right? Every it creates yeah. a reaction. Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking about this actually just last week because um, I was thinking about how if um, if I walk into a meeting late, which I've done a lot just today, I apologize to you guys, <laughs> but but just recently, I, if I, wa I walk into a meeting late, um, I still have this like old gut reaction to be like, what's my excuse? You're like, what? <laughs> do I need to like, do I need to like make this more tragic or believable? or something to not look so bad right and i think when i when i'm doing that in a space that's like there's leadership or you know perceived kind of fear you know i think it's a it's all this natural reaction we have to like make sure we're covered and to be able to come in and say i literally just saw the wrong time on my calendar like i literally mm -hmm. just messed up is very freeing to be able to do that but one of the things when you said the two-way street thing got me thinking that like What's so important was also that I find that I have that tendency when I'm the leader too, 
Like when I'm a leader and I show up late, I also go, I don't want to like look, but, but I think it's so important that as the leader, I also come to this space and say, I messed up. Like I totally just missed this or I did something really boneheaded or whatever. And I'm sorry because that gives the permission. I, I think people don't realize enough that fear kind of exists in all these places that we demand perfection and we demand performance amongst from everyone and we don't allow people to be real and human and yeah if, if i keep doing it someone needs to talk to me but i'm, I'm <laughs> I, I think i think that's where i really caught myself earlier this week i think maggie you were there <laughs> because i keep I'm just, <laughs> sorry maggie i keep showing up your meetings this but 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 literally it's just like i had one with maggie this week. i was just like i just thought this meeting was at a different time and i'm sorry and like I know that wasn't a big deal, Maggie. You didn't, you know, we didn't make a big deal out of it. But I'm thinking about it now because it's like, it, in little ways like that, I think it it could create or remove fear depending on how we handle those things. Yeah. So, and I think but, that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. I was actually going to ask you a question, Maggie, because I'm, I'm oh, like go for going it. back to your situation with that boss who like <laughs> would uh, check on you in ways that were like very concerning to hear. Mm -hmm. um, if he would have actually opened up to you and said, Maggie. I'm afraid that you're going to leave me, which is why I check on you all the time or why I'm afraid yeah. to, or why I'm not being, you know, sort of forward with you in certain ways. Would that have changed your reaction or would that have sort of made you feel weird or awkward? <laughs> all, all of the above. <laughs> right. um, well, to be fair, I don't think that was the motivation behind this boss. I'm not saying that it was. I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm giving him too much credit. I'm, <laughs> I got that too. <laughs> but um, if that was a reason, if, if if he were to be vulnerable in that way with you after all of that type of sort of environment building, how would you have it, responded? I think it would have de depended, I guess, on like mm -hmm. how, what, what he said. Because if it was like, I never leave me, like you can't ever <laughs> yeah. leave here. Like, yeah. That, of course, would make me uncomfortable because yeah. business is business. No one stays somewhere forever <laughs> except Ever, a very right. few people. Um, and then it, and also it was like, I was very young. I think I was 23 or four at the time. So it was like, I'm obviously not staying here forever. But um, I don't know if he had, if he had been vulnerable about literally anything about his life in general. Yeah, I feel like. I would have at least had a basis of some sort of relationship to be like, okay, I know that he at least likes me as a human. And so mm -hmm. therefore we can move forward in building a like professional relationship um, that I don't know. I, it's hard to imagine him ever doing that. That's why I'm struggling <laughs> to answer this question. Um, it's a long time ago. Maybe he's changed. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um <laughs> Yeah, but I just think I'm like everything y'all are saying is is making me think of um, just the fact that like that fear and that anxiety is so rampant in like the millennial Gen Z generation, um, and it's a really popular topic on social media right now mm -hmm. to like talk about corporate anxiety. And um, have you guys ever heard the term um, green dot watchers? No, I haven't. It's um like companies who watch people's chat statuses make sure they're online uh, at all times oh my gosh like that's what, like i have friends that work for companies that are quote unquote green dot watchers um and they like get nervous if they take too long to go to the bathroom or like if oh, they, i saw like, things I saw, like that i saw a tick i was wondering what this, i saw a TikTok of a guy who built a machine that would just move his mouse every yes. five, every minute just to make sure yes. while he was working <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. Sense. So that your screen doesn't <laughs> fall asleep and then you're not active on, on the That's Microsoft crazy. Teams or Google Chat or Slack or whatever you use. But um, it's it's so prevalent and like I I'm just again just am thankful because if I worked for an organization like that, what I would be doing would be looking for a way out as soon as possible. Yeah. And I don't think I think people. I think leaders who implement those kinds of policies or like create that kind of culture um, think that it has to, it directly ties to performance. And like, if you're working eight full hours or you appear to be working eight full hours, you get more done. But personally, I love taking my long lunch and gym break in the middle of the day. 
Like yeah. that is what's best for me and my productivity. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. if I right. don't have that like little break in the middle of the day to like move my body and not think about work, like forget it for the rest of the day because <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not, I'll be there, but I'm not thinking. I'm just thinking about all the things I want to do or, you know, when I'm going to yeah. be able to work out after work or <laughs> when I'm, you know, going to be able to cook and all these things. And, and so I, I am so thankful that I'm not even fearful if I'm like not online for over an hour on my lunch break, because I'm, I'm going to be back and people trust <laughs> that I'll still get my yeah. stuff done. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. You know, no one will be waiting <laughs> on me. So I don't know. But I, I'm like sitting here and I'm thinking like, can you imagine like I'm just I'm going to a place where someone taps me on the shoulder with having a four year degree student loans and says, hey, Chris, your job is to see when people go, you know, red <laughs> or, or inactive. And you let me know as soon as that happens. And you're, you're basically <laughs> watching the screen to see who's red. Yeah. And then it's your job to go and run that up the flagpole and make sure that everybody knows there's some employee somewhere, regardless of what's going on, who's red. And that's like your, your job, right? Like, yeah, I just I, I hear that. And I think of all of the wasted time, <laughs> money, um, systems, technology tools that we could be solving much bigger problems inside of an organization. And that's that's literally what is on the t top leader's mind is like, is my team actually working Not if they're productive? Not mm -hmm. if we're meeting our goals, not if we, like, but like, am I paying? The, like, are they literally earning every single penny that we pay them by being mm -hmm. available to us, even if the work they're doing is is not necessarily earning value or you know bringing us or our customers you know additional worth, uh, customer yeah. revenue? Like, is, I I'm sitting and I'm like, that would be. I, I don't know what I would do if someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, that's your new assignment. <laughs> I mean, so this yeah. actually, I this this just brought up a another, sorry, I'm going back to TikTok again, but <laughs> maybe I, this points out a problem I have. Okay. I was on TikTok the, just just yesterday, maybe, and there, were, there was this video of a guy who posted his story and he didn't specify details of the company or anything, but he posted a story saying that um, someone was leaving this company that he worked for and he was kind of... Um, passing down his job that he, his main task he did that would take him one or two days every week to do this report type thing and this dude inherited inher inherited that that task from the guy and he said within the first day or two um that they audit that this guy just wrote a script that automated that down and basically optimized it down to like a five minute script and so he took that and he would run it every monday and then take the day off basically and then send the report by the end of the week and everyone's like oh great job and he did this for years and years and he said even one time when he was out for um vacation or whatever and someone else had to do it he he made he taught them the manual way to do it and the people were like how do you do this in a day how do you do this in two days <laughs> and so like everyone's like thinking he's like this good like this amazing like and and that's that, that's not the part of the story. I mean, that story is hilarious, but also, you know, in the same vein that we're talking about, about like, imagine what this guy could do if he applied that ingenuity to the rest of the business. Like, I mean, he just streamlined yeah. a process down to like a, a percent of what it was. Um, but what blew my mind was, as I do with all TikToks that interest me, I started scrolling through comments. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just scrolling through comments. And, and when we say bring humanity back to the workplace, those comments are what I'm talking about because mm -hmm. while I'm sitting there going, man, this, this business could do so much better to like get some talent like this in a place where they care and like want to contribute. Um, but the comments were all like, just like congratulating this guy and telling this guy how he's a hero and like, mm -hmm. like should have milked it for more and all like, given all the finding more. And, and so when we when people come and ask us like what do you mean like bring humanity back to the workplace you're saying humanity is not in the workplace i'm like yeah it's not because <laughs> look at the, the trend of like work just being a four letter word to people like work being negative inherently you don't have to say anything else about it you don't have to give any context just be like oh i got work people's like oh i'm sorry <laughs> i'm like well, i'm like like literally cuz i work at night sometimes cuz we we get stuff done and 
I truly don't mind it at all because it's my choice to do so. And I plan around my life and my schedule. My kids go to bed. But when I tell my friends, oh, I can't tonight. I got some work. They're like, oh, man, that sucks. Your company sucks, man. I don't like I can't believe they make you do that. I'm like, no, nobody made me do this. Like I, I could have <laughs> scheduled this other ways, but this works best. because I got to work with some people in India and I, I don't want to let them down. And they're like, they just don't get like they cannot fathom that that's the case. They're like, you're you, they're like your boss sucks. I'm like, I'm my boss most of the time. Like, like, <laughs> and and so when we say bring humanity back work, because I just can't get over the fear of like just corporate that still sits in our environments after all this is coming forward, you know? Yeah. yeah. That also reminds me of like the trend that happened recently um, where a lot of women like came out speaking about how um, they got negative responses from their bosses when they had to let them know that they had had a miscarriage. And so they would like some time off from work. Um, and just like the, just the backlash that all that got, or like there was one woman, there was this like picture that she posted of like, she was literally in labor in the hospital. She had her laptop out because she was trying to send an email to her boss to be like, Hey, so sorry. I'm, I'm not going to be at work. Like blah, 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 blah. And the response was something along the lines of like, um, I wonder why, like, this wasn't more scheduled or planned or like some it, I'm butchering it word for word, but like that was the gist of it. And it's just crazy. Like the amount of people that relate to that and, and think the same thing, because I'm thinking like those things have happened in our organization and those women were given the freedom to do what they need to do. No questions asked really until they came back and they were ready to share and they were ready to talk about it really if if something like that happened to me I know all I would need to do is send one text to someone doesn't even matter who be like hey I'm taking a week personal time something came up and they'd be like okay see you when you get back we'll we'll take care of it um and I don't I don't think people realize the value in that that much because when you're thinking about it in a different way it's like oh well then wouldn't everybody just like say they need a week all the time or like wouldn't that get annoying having to like pick up people slack all the time and people don't do it all the time. Like they don't <laughs> like when you're given that freedom, people like 99% of people don't abuse that. You and arguably work to. harder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, yeah. You bring up a good point in that. Cause that's typically the pushback that we get is people who are worried about the edge case of some bad actor taking advantage of everything all at once. And it's like, if you hire a team of only bad actors, I have to now wonder and question who's doing the hiring and if they are a bad actor, because you are likely <laughs> hiring people that are just like you, right? Mm -hmm. But more often than not, I promise you that people are not there to take advantage. People are not showing up trying to do their worst work possible people are there to really bring forward, you know, their best and, and do their best and, and sort of offer their best. <clears throat> but so many people push back on these sort of like new age ideas <laughs> because they, they think only of the bad actors who are going to somehow take advantage of the entire system and bring it all down. And then it's going to be complete and utter chaos. And so these policies that we've been operating under for so long, you know, they served us so well that we can't change it. And if we change it, you know, you, you know, our cities are going to burn down and wolves are going to roam the streets and, you know, <laughs> our, our women and children will be pillaged. And like all of these like situations arise <laughs> just from the idea of like actually trusting someone. <laughs> you know what, you know, what's really cool is actually when, when this happens, like we, we generally, like we genuinely, for the most part, everyone I can think of in this organization and, I'm sorry if we, we our organization is not perfect. <laughs> just just to be yeah. clear, I, I keep I yeah. I catch myself, but I I just want to share that like like I've seen so many times when people genuinely and we know this because relationships and we can tell that like we really just like really wanted to be here and if we just cannot for personal reasons for whatever is going on and like the first thing that happens when we say we need that we need that help we need that space is like everyone like. Like Maggie says, no questions asked. We come and we try to solve. We just get, we just rally around and we keep the business going, keep the work going. I've seen so many times that actually leads to a lot of the like the T-shapedness of our team comes from the swarming around a hole that needs to be filled because someone needed, someone has something happen. Um, like Chris, when you had a situation with your father in the hospital, 
um, you're a very critical player in a lot of different things. And like, it wasn't a situation was like, oh, Chris, but we still need you. We still like, and like, we, 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 we did what we could. Not everything was perfect, but we also had a lot of opportunities to learn in that space and figure things out for ourselves. It's like this weird extra bonus of stepping in uncomfortable places that you wouldn't otherwise, because we really not, we didn't want to let you down. We wanted to do the job as good as you would have, that you can come back to something that was done right. And so we tried our best to, to learn that space as well. I thought that was a really interesting side effect of, of that you know, culture. And I remember like in that time period where, you know, a uh, really critical care issue came up and <clears throat> I had no predictability. Like I didn't like, I couldn't schedule anything with the doctors. The, you know, if, if anybody has ever, ever had to take care of a sick parent, you know that you have absolutely no control over the scheduling. <laughs> Right. And, you know, knowing that one at no point in the back of my head was I thinking like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to lose my job because I, I, I have to head out. Um, but also there was also never that guilt coming back to you, because even if that is not present, sometimes there is a guilt that gets uh, sort of sent back your way. Like all mm -hmm. these guilt trips, like, well, since you're going to be out all next week, maybe you should do some of this today and maybe you should own up to this and maybe you should take on right like that never was a part of it either. And, you know, when you have an organization where that fear is absent, it allows for one people to be extremely loyal. Two, it opens up so much more opportunity for others to learn and try new things, as, as you just mentioned, Jeff. Um, and, and personally, it allowed me to just focus on what needed to get my attention at the time, which was my dad getting his health restored. Um, but, yeah. you know, I think that that's so hard. But at the same time, people were also reaching out and saying, hey, how are you? What can I do for you? Right. Like, so you have it wasn't just this like let Chris go off and do his thing, but people were still genuinely care too. So it was, yeah, our, it our was meetings nice. would be like, our meetings would be like, anyone know an update on Chris's dad? Anybody got update on Chris's dad? <laughs> like that's how our meetings would all start. <laughs> and, and when it, and when it's celebratory, like when it's a, a time off or personal time or mental health or whatever, it's like a celebration. It's like, we're like, yeah. you're off for the rest of the week. All right. Go get it. Like enjoy it. Like, like don't yeah. talk, don't yeah. call us. Don't text us. We don't want to hear from you. Like, yeah. Have a good one. Yeah. And I also just like a small extra piece to that, which I I'm appreciative of is in all like kind of preface this with like a personal anecdote, but like mm -hmm. this about this time last year, um, a family member of mine passed away and it wasn't a family member who I was really very close to with, but it was a family member who my father was uh, legally responsible for uh, based on just her past of mental health issues and, and all that. And so it ended up being just kind of this big mess for my parents and they were super stressed and just stretched really thin. And so I texted Mo and I said, Hey, I need to take the week off and help my parents. He said, great. Um, please just do what you need to do. We'll see you when you get back. And I remember being asked literally constantly that week by family that was in town or, um, my oh my parents even like don't you need to be at work like shouldn't you be working I'm like no I, I asked to take this time to help my family not because and, and because I think there's this like and Jeff something you said earlier like to catastrophize your situation like I didn't need to be like oh my dad was in a car accident and I need to go help like I, I can be honest and, and be like you know this this family member who I'm not very close with passed away and it's causing drama and stress for my immediate family so therefore I want to support them they need my help right now mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. I was so thankful for that but the the extra piece that I was really thinking about Chris when we were talking was mm -hmm. I came back from that week not worried that like there's this there's always this kind of underlying sense of competition right like in business I don't feel that it's awfully but I have felt that mm -hmm. before and there was that there was that sense of like no one took anything from me. No one used that opportunity to get ahead or step over me or forget about me. Like I remember specifically that week that I was out happened to be a week where a lot of company things changed. Um, oh, yeah. And I came, I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I came back. I came back from that week off. Immediately had a meeting with Mo to fill me in on everything that I had missed and and. It, 
and to tell me that they had already discussed my place in this change and that they had already thought about me, even though I wasn't there. And I think that that was what really meant a lot to me was that I didn't have to be there to fight for my own spot and my own worth in the company, but I was thought about in a positive light, even when I needed to be away from work. So I hadn't yeah. heard that part yet of that story. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Uh, yeah, no, I, I keep going back to like listening to you, Maggie, and listening to Jeff and like, like, so where does it come from? Where does it come? Like, where, what, yeah. like, what is the origin of it? And like, all I can think about is <clears throat> somebody told me a long time ago that a lot of business strategy is inherited from the military hmm. and specifically wartime, you know, militaristic strategy. Um, and, you know, we think about dominating and penetrating and like, you know, going out to battle, right? Like all that wartime mindset was institutionalized inside of business. Um, and the unfortunate thing when you have that mindset, and I read this book called The Wisdom of Psychopaths, but, you know, in that book, it's, it's a great, like, it's it's out there, but I it, it, appeased, it appealed to me and appeased, you know, that <laughs> curiosity. Um, you know, he, he, the author called out um, that when you have mercenaries and these barbarians and like the, the, the at that time, the men who would go out and fight these wars, they didn't know how to shut it off. And so they would come home and bring that same desire for carnage and violence back into the communities where they were supposed to like care and show love and concern. And a lot of, in a lot of ways, we still have that mindset when we come internally inside of our organizations. And now our, our, our coworker becomes our enemy. Our leader becomes the thing that we have to fight against and war with the, and whatnot, because in many organizations, you are cushioned away from the competitors in a way that you don't have to think about in every single role who you're competing with and how you're going to win against them. Instead, you're now thinking about the people that you work with as your immediate threat and the people who might take an opportunity away, who might take your next raise or next recognition away um, and so that mindset you don't know how to switch between competitive mode and then internal growth and support and sort of care mode and mm -hmm. so when you are intentional in those mindsets is what i'm thinking like you can easily turn your co-worker into your competitor and therefore still operate in wartime when you should be in community <laughs> building time right yeah, and, and I think as a takeaway for all this, because this isn't ultimately a podcast, I forgot we're recording. Um, <laughs> yeah. I guess as a, as a takeaway for all this, um, I would say that we talk about trust a lot. I mean, trust is basically not the silver bullet, but it is the beginning of the answer for many, 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 many things. But I think people don't always, the simplest way I can put it for, for me, why and how any of this is possible, again, it's more so in some pockets, not perfect everywhere. But for me, all the stories we just shared, the common theme is not just trust, but there's trust of intent, right? So it's like, trust is one thing. And I do trust, we have trust in the spades in all sorts of ways. But what, what we're describing when people can say, hey, I need a week off um, and no questions asked. What we're describing when we say, sure, no problem, we got you covered is that we trust each other's intent to the point that, you know, it, it's not, you don't have to become best friends. You don't have to become, you know, family as people would quote it. No, it's just, I trust that you, you care about what we're doing here. You care about me. You care about the outcomes here and you wouldn't do anything to jeopardize that. Um, and that you're using your best judgment, like those types of, and that just comes from relationships that comes from that type of trust, that level of trust. And, you know, to me, that's a takeaway. Um, if there's any, is that, you got to build your relationships. You got to build that type of trust with people. And that only comes through knowing people at a deeper level, more so than their work output, more so than their work habits and the predictive things that they can do, but also build a little bit of vulnerability between each other. And once you get to know each other, then you, you'll start being able to say, you know what, you know, like, I know that that's, that's sucky and that, other people might take advantage of the situation, but I know you're not taking advantage of the situation. You are, you have, your heart is in the right place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I, well yeah. said. Yep. Well, this was more than uh, we bargained for. So thank you for staying 
through the whole episode to Maggie and Chris and also the audience if you're still with us. Um, let us know if you like this type of episode. Um, sometimes we start talking and we just we have a lot to say all the time. It's like, why not record it? If you enjoyed it, let us know. Give us that feedback. If you didn't, also let us know. We can take it, but we love your feedback. Uh, thank you so much for listeners. New episodes every week. Check out our book, Love is a Business Strategy. Maggie wrote that forward about fear. So it's in there. Go give it another read. And um, as always, subscribe, rate, and tell a friend. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you all.